so yes, as, as Klaus uh, mentioned, the title of this talk is about what determines navigation ability. Why are some people good and why are other people bad at navigating? So if we uh, take uh, this group of people as an example, um, you know, there might be somebody in this group of four people who's really fantastic at navigating. They almost never go wrong. On the other hand, there might be someone in this group who's always lost. They, they've really struggled to find their way. It's one of these skills in life that really varies across human ability. Um, and it's really evident because of the mistakes that can, can occur um, with it that, that are frustrating in real life. The real question is that what determines the success for this group of people at getting to their their destination. So imagine they're on holiday in a in a um, somewhere that looks like a European city, and they've come. They're using a paper map, uh, so maybe they're not, they're uh, you know they're not using digital in this case. But in this case, their their familiarity with the space is going to matter. How complicated that environment is. What are they trying to do? Are they going to go to multiple places? Are they needing to go somewhere far or close by? But also the ability. This last component. What's going to determine the success? And the question I'm going to explore with, uh, and look over the data for is uh, what might determine that? So there might be some, I'm going to go through a number of uh, topics and there's a really great review, you know, 20, uh, 11 years old uh, by uh, Thomas Walbers and Mary Hegarty and uh, Tix a while back that sort of tap, tacks into a lot of the, the topics that I'm going to raise, but um, this talk's kind of an update to that really nice review and it's probably time uh, and people are working on this to pull together more, more stories around this. So one of the things I'm going to start with, because I work in neuroscience, is brain structure. It doesn't matter um, how parts of your brain are structured. Might the good navigator in the group have a better structured brain? Uh, might this to be, might their skill of navigating relate to how they're coding information? Like what is their brain actually doing? Not just the structure, but what is it, what is it doing? There's a long, my internet's saying it's a bit unstable. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Let me know. I'm gonna use Klaus's face to indicate if that's okay. So there's a long standing um, evidence that maybe gender matters for, for navigation advantage and we'll tap into that as we get older uh, it affects various abilities and one of them appears to be navigation so we'll, we'll look at whether that how, how that affects navigation skill and what i'll touch on today is culture what i mean by that is shared um things in our society that we all um ad, you know tap into uh you know certain groups of peoples um have certain um environmental features around them that mean they will cognitively operate in a different way. So in the sense of today's talk, I'm going to look at culture in terms of how different countries really um, might have groups of navigators in them. And finally, I'm going to look at the environment. So not, not so much the, the culture in terms of metrics around that, but the specific geo um, you know, aspects of the earth and the way we structure our cities and environments, how might that affect uh, the development of navigation skills? So, uh, you know, coming from UCL, it would be odd if I didn't start with this story, this famous story from Eleanor McGuire, uh, her study many years ago. It was 21 years ago, Eleanor McGuire decided she would scan a group of London taxi drivers um, and take MRI measurements of their brain. And, and as you can see in this diagram here, um, measure the volumetric uh, density of their gray matter in their hippocampus. And she was looking at this because it had been noted in other animal species, other mammals that Hippocampal size might vary as a function of, of navigation skill and with season. But what about humans? And these taxi drivers, the reason she became interested in them was that they spend like two to four years training in London to memorize 26,000 streets uh, to, to then sit an exam. And that exam, it, typically they fail it 16 times or so to pass it. To Finally, they're allowed to operate one of these black, you know, black cabs in London. And um, they can then charge people a lot of money to just take them anywhere. But only if you've got that knowledge, it's called the knowledge of London, are they able to operate these cabs and pick people up off the street? And the key there is that they're only allowed to do this if they can use their memory, they're actually use their own brain, not GPS to do this. And I thought this was gonna die out many years ago, but they are still training uh, by the hundreds to, to get a chance to work in these cabs. And I think what's keeping that going is that it's like a giant jigsaw puzzle and they actually quite like getting paid to drive around and solve jigsaw puzzles in their head uh, as part of that job. Um, one of the key features of this original publication was, well, first of all, that the hippocampal size is different in taxi drivers to non-hippocampal, uh, to non-taxi drivers. Um, so this suggests that if you're really good at navigating, you may have a larger posterior hippocampus, 
But in fact, their anterior hippocampus shrinks, it seems, or is smaller, I should say, in this cross-sectional data set. Um, so it's not that the hippocampus is just bigger. It's the fact that there's a redistribution that appears within the gray matter density in the anterior and the posterior. And in particular, there was a nice uh, correlation between the number of ye- like months going up to 350 months driving ataxy in London. So that's many, many year decades. Uh, and the amount of uh, posterior gray matter density seemed to be mildly correlated. Uh, many years later, when I got a chance to um, work with Ellen McGuire, we scanned uh, taxi drivers again and found a very similar correlation, perhaps more convincingly, this time in a group of 20. And we're also able to show that this, this larger posterior hippocampus is, is, is there when you compare taxi drivers to bus drivers. So bus drivers just take the same route through London all the time. Uh, they don't have to think flexibly. They don't do all the things, but they do have to sit through London pollution. They do have to deal with annoying customers and they do experience the, the sort of flow of the environment whilst uh, driving a vehicle. So they're a good control for quite a few factors, but we don't see these kind of changes with uh, gray matter over time, nor do you see it, by the way, with doctors. If you're a medical student training, by the time you reach a consultant, your hippocampus is very boring still. There's no major change there. Uh, in a publication of our, but we also found that if you retire from being a taxi driver, 10 years later, there's a, there seems to be mild evidence that there might be a reduction in hippocampal size. So it's not something you gain and keep for the rest of your life if you're if you're working. It seems to be something you have to keep working at, but it's very hard to get strong data on that. What was more impressive, a key study in this in this slide, is that really um, Katia Willett, working with Ellen McGuire, studied seventy uh, participants who went into training to become taxi drivers and a group of boring non like people who didn't train to become taxi drivers. And so she could scan their brains with MRI uh, longitudinally at one point before training and after training. And for people who didn't do any training, there's no change in their hippocampus. But if they did train, she was able to detect that there was a significant increase, quite a like, clear significant increase in the posterior hippocampal density with training. And I take that to be a much stronger piece of evidence than the cross-sectional studies above. Um, what was particularly nice was that a group of people who trained who failed never managed to master the skill of london they didn't show any changes in their brain so it seems like um there's a there's a good correlation with actually mastering that skill and brain structure so that's the story from taxi drivers we're literally about to start re-scanning taxi drivers again because it's been you know many years since they've been examined you know 10 years and mri methods have got I've gone on a bit since 10 years. So we'd like to have another look at their data and, and, and brains and see what we can we can learn from looking in more detail at subregions, perhaps. Um, we've also just published a well, we just sorry, we put out a preprint uh, on how do they do that? How do they learn the knowledge? Um, so people are interested in how you can increase uh, spatial learning or look at improved spatial learning. This is going to provide every skill in the toolbox, every sort of skill you would want in a toolbox for, for how to how to learn a, a new environment. They've got all the tricks going back to 1853 when the, this, this uh, test was first uh, developed um, following the disaster in the UK. It was a great exhibition where people got lost to live in London and they needed taxi drivers to get people to this great exhibition. But anyway, these are taxi drivers. There's some reasonably good evidence over many studies that their brains are different with real expertise and that they're not different when they start. That's the key story there. But what about the rest of us? What if you're, like going back to my question, the people who are really good at navigating, do they just happen to have a bigger hippocampus? So-called normal people, non-taxi drivers. Well, there are a number of studies that I'm going to summarize them, and I may have missed some, but in this slide, I'll summarize the studies that have looked at correlations between using MRI uh, between hippocampal volume or phonic structure with DTI and navigation accuracy. And the ones I'm going to put in red are null results and the green ones are where there's some significant relationship. So way back in 2003, you found no effect, uh, no relationship between having a large hippocampus and navigation accuracy in a study I looked at uh, in 2003 with Ellen McGuire. Uh, here's the kind of data. It's not, not convincing at all. But then uh, Victor Shiznazi and Russell Epstein and, and colleagues um, um, looked at a, a group of participants in real world learning and found there was a significant correlation in that group of 13 participants between the hippocampal size 
and their ability to acquire a new map suggesting there might actually be a relationship. And then a few years ago, um, Eva Brunek, um, working with uh, Morris Moscovich um, and Shana Rosenbaum and others, and collaborating with myself and Zita Pata, I looked at a group of 62 participants to see, and we found there was a relationship between the density of the gray matter in their posterior hippocampus to anterior, that ratio that changes in taxi drivers, that that was related to uh, navigation to some degree. Uh, there was a consistent weak pattern in the data. However, in a number of studies, uh, Steve Weisberg ran a larger sample of 80 participants pre-registering it and found no relationship in his virtual reality task at, at learning new environments and the size of the hippocampus. Um, Carl Hoggett's is another study coming. So going just chrono chronologically, this fight over time, going forwards in 2020, published a paper with 33 people suggesting that having a having a, a uh, an efficiently structured uh, fornix so uh, it's very healthy led to better it was linked to better navigation skill in a kind of virtual uh, Morris, Morris water maze and then most recently Ian Clark and Ellen McGuire with a large sample of 217 people uh, had people watch a movie and then sequence landmarks to remember where the position of landmarks was and found no relationship between hippocampal volume and that task so the upshot of this is that it's a bit mixed uh, they, uh, you know, it's not clear if there is a relationship between the size of these brain structures and navigation skill. Um, I think this story of just having a bigger bit of the brain and that and that driving navigation skill is is probably uh, not a great plausible story. And there's a very nice review by Steve Weisberg and Arne Ekstrom that just came out uh, discussing this idea and what might be going on uh, in in the brains of uh, good navigators. So I worth recommend reading that in relation to this story. So that's structure of the brain, and those are the key articles and where we are, a mixed set of results. But what about function? I mean, this seems to me to be more, more a key uh, issue about why someone might be a good navigator is that they're efficiently using their brain. And this is very likely to do with the use of the, the coding cells in their brain. Uh, for which John O'Keefe, um, May Britton, Edvard Moser won the uh, Nobel Prize a few years ago. So back in the 1970s, John O'Keefe first reported um, place cells. So this work shown in this slide, many of you watching this will be very familiar with this. This is rats running around in boxes uh, where you can track neural data and their position. So in this diagram here in black, we've got the trajectory of a, a rat running around a square box and overlaid in red and green dots are the action potentials of an individual cell. This cell only discharges action potentials when the rat is pretty much in the middle of the box. And if you record from multiple play cells, they'll tile this space. Each one will prefer a slightly different part of the box. And they sort of provide a you are here signal so that other downstream regions of the brain could code link information to where, uh, where a, an agent, a rat or a human, whoever it is that's got the cells, is coding their current position. In 2005, uh, Maybritt and Edvard's group reported these grid cells, which are really still, I think, one of the most remarkable cells in the brain. Whereas a rat scurries around randomly searching for food, they also fire these individual cells in the, uh, in the entorhinal cortex and in connected regions um, in particular bits of the space, but in this beautiful tessellating grid pattern over the, the box. And below is a set of three cells recorded in one rat running around the same square box. And if you take the center of these grid fields, you can see they're all perfectly just slightly offset. So you have each of these individual cells as like a, a layer of graph paper sitting on the environment, slightly shifted uh, relative to each other so that you can tile the space with this amazing tessellating pattern. And these have been thought to be the kind of metric for large scale space for how we code as we move through a space, our, our our translation, our, our, um, our movements through the space and map that. Um, in addition to coding the, the position of space in the play cells and the, and the grid cells, our cells in uh, the anterior thalamus and posterior subiculum and various parts of the limbic system that discharge action potentials when um, animals, um, mostly studied in rats, are facing in a particular head orientation environment. Um, so the example cells, these are polar plots from two example cells, and these are really remarkable. When this rat is facing 42 degrees from north, this cell will fire at 26 hertz continuously with very little change in its firing rate. But if it moves off to even just say 47 degrees, that firing rate might drop to zero. It won't discharge at all. And it will not discharge the cell whenever the rat is facing at all towards the south in any direction. Whereas there's another cell here um, firing in the kind of um, northwesterly direction. So if you've got a whole circuit of these head direction cells, they can inform other brain areas 
what direction um, you're facing in. So a key idea between why is someone a good navigator and some, why someone is a bad navigator, the crux of my talk is that they've got very good tuned cells in their hippocampus and trigonal cortex and limbic structures that fire in a very tight tuning to different directions and provide us a, a very tight spatial code that's reproducible. Back in 1997, uh, Carol Barnes, a really beautiful study in nature showing that as rats get older, these cells get more unstable and more fuzzy. And the rats, very highly correlated with this increased fuzziness in the cells, lose their spatial uh, navigation ability. So at least in terms of aging rats, we can see there's this link between um, the precision of these cell codes and navigation ability. So what about humans? I'm going to spend my talk and tap in right at the end to, to, to back to, to animals right at the end. But I'm going to focus on animals today. Um, how about neural coding and accuracy? So there are three things we can think about here. One is about the increased activity in brain areas when we're accurate. So accurate navigators are the bits of the brain that are more accurate when we're doing that. What about spatial coding? Um, we've looked at those individual cells in, in rats, but what about if we look at using MRI and look at navigation systems and activity? Uh, and finally, we can look and say, people who are good at navigating, what is it they're doing? Is there a more precise code? Not just is there more of something, but how does the precision change? So um, going back some time uh, to sort of key studies I can draw out, but there are others in various studies. Um, there was a key, one of the earliest studies is one by Thomas Wolbers, where he had people do a visual path integration task. And the more accurate people were at passing through the environment, turning in a, in a, in a, a wide landscape with no visual features, using visual flow information, and then asked, they were asked to point back to where they'd come from. The more accurate they were at pointing back to where they thought they'd come from, the more activity they showed in their anterior hippocampus. Similar pattern was found by Tom Hartley um, and when he was working in, in Neil Burgess' group, uh, reported in, in Neuron 2003, where the more accurate navigators were through an virtual environment, the more activity they showed in their hippocampus. So this kind of shows that, that this key area of the brain that contains these place cells, and we can see them in, in studies in humans in electrical recordings from depth electrodes in patients, um, that it seems that their engagement um, might be higher or the more um, bold response, certainly uh, in the human brain when people are accurately navigating. But what about that coding? That Those studies don't tell us about what's being coded in accurate navigators. So I was going to run over a few studies where we're summarizing some, some data to say what might be going on when we actually navigate. So a lot of studies like the, the, the ones here are just, you know, very coarse, but what happens when we go to a new city and that's actually what we did in this study. There are two published papers in the last few years back from our group where we took people, we took them to Soho um, in London, which is this really busy uh, or was before the pandemic. And this was certainly run before the pandemic. Uh, lots of bars and shops. So every street corner has some very clear landmarks. And the streets, as you can see in this photograph, are really short. There's a really dense network of streets there. That means that in, say, in one minute, you might pass through seven different streets just walking through the area. That's good for, for looking at navigation uh, as a task in MRI. What we had was people walk the environment. They spent two and a half hours walking around, learning on a guided tour where places were. The next day, we scanned them as they watched first-person first view movies as they passed through this environment taking novel routes they'd never taken before, sort of pieced together experiences they had from the day before. Um, and they had to actually navigate to goals. They were kind of playing the role of the, the navigator in the car seat next to someone actually who was doing all the controls of driving. And they were just asked, right, guide me to the target. Um, and we also gave them a, a control condition where they just, like a sat-nav said, you know, it told you what turns to take throughout the environment. And the upshot is that when the, when the sat-nav is running and you're asked to just make a response, there's no correlation between uh, MRI activity, fMRI activity, the bold signal we can see, and any of the spatial coding parameters we look at at all. It just dampens out in our data. But when we look at the active periods and people have to recall what they'd experienced in the environment to, to navigate, we could look at how the activity in certain brain areas related to the information in the environment. So one of the key results we found, and this was replicated in other studies, was that at the beginning of a route, and to some extent along the route, um, the the um, entorhinal activity, particularly in the right hemisphere, was correlated with the Euclidean distance to the target. So this is independent of all those buildings you can see in the way. If you're trying to go to a particularly exciting bar on the other side of Soho, um, then the closer you are in the space, 
um, sorry, the, the further away that bar might be in the, in the space, the more activity you'd engage in your entorhinal cortex. As if computing something about that distance over the buildings through the space, um, and that we think is is linked to that idea of the grid cells. These tessellate the environment. They don't really care about the structure of the buildings in the space, but they do care about the the Euclidean surface of the environment you're navigating on. So it seems that when you're navigating and first setting out that computation about um, your your direction and distance to your to your goal is is done by the entorhinal cortex. At least that's the what we would see would match models by uh, Neil Burke group and others would, would suggest that. But what happens when you're off, you're actually navigating through the, through the environment. But what we found was that um, as you pass through, certainly at, um, at uh, decision points, but also along the way as you're traveling, it's the distance along the path that, that matters to the hippocampus. As if the, and again, this is consistent in our perspective with the idea the hippocampus might uh, reactivate sequences of uh, sequences of place cells along routes to future target locations you want to get to. Uh, and, and every day there's some new study. There's one that just came out, a really nice study from Laura Colgan's group showing uh, performance relates to the these sort of sequences we see in the rat hippocampus. Here we're finding that the further away from the uh, goal, the more activity we see in the human hippocampus. And we see this in, in other studies we've run as well in these kind of open city-like environments. But others have also found hippocampal activity tracking the goal distance in sparse uh, virtual environments. And I've got a new review where just, we've just gone to under review looking at this and um, discussing this in more detail. One of the other key results we found um, reported in Nature Communications a few years ago was that as people step into a new view, like this view here, and you look down a new street, if it's a if it's a street with many connections and many places you need to you could go to, we'll see more hippocampal activity evoked. But if it's a dead end, you'll see a reduction in hippocampal activity, consistent with the idea that hippocampus might be simulating possible routes through the environment, and that the new view, the new space you step into, might drive changes in that simulation process. Um, again, this and this ties into the ideas of sort of scene construction and simulation of the future that the hippocampus is not just engaged in recalling the past, but actually structuring future possibilities in the space. So stepping out from these uh, real world environments into virtual uh, spaces, um, a few years ago, we looked at um, uh, directional coding. So I mentioned the head direction cells, and there are a number of really nice studies showing similar evidence of directional coding in the um, entorhinal cortex and other bits of the brain. Um, here, what we thought we'd do is look at goal direction coding to see if we could find a brain area that tells you what direction your goal uh, lies in. And we had people learn uh, very quickly, eight minutes walking around a virtual courtyard where there are four objects around a fountain. And we then put them in the scanner and asked them to make judgments about the direction to these different objects from different places in the environment. And they could make those judgments in an egocentric sense of, is on my left or is it on my right? But also in an allocentric sense of, is the goal to the north or south or west, where we had very distinct landscapes in these directions. And the upshot of that, um, that experiment was that we could see activity in the entorhinal cortex and that sort of entorhinal subicular area that appeared to be sensitive to the um, representations of the allocentric direction to the goal. So not my egocentric, but is the goal to my north or south or east or west? Uh, and the reason I'm going into this and this question for good and bad navigators is that more accurate people were, and the people were very accurate, but the upper end of the spectrum, the more accurate they were, the more precision we could get in there, the more we could decode their facing orientation within this environment. So it does seem, like I said, like the rats with Carol Barnes' beautiful work back in the 90s. In humans, we can also see that the more precise the code, um, the, more, uh, the more accurate the navigator. And this matches very nicely with data from Christian Dohler, his famous study in Nature in 2010, where he reported grid-like activity in the human MRI signal um, in 36 participants, but also hidden in that paper is a really nice plot between the performance metric of how well they navigated and how coherent those grid-like patterns were. And so the more coherent these are, the better people would perform. These just give us hints that this story, going back to the rats, may also be true in humans. The more precise the code, in this case in the entorhinal region, the more um, good the navigator will be. So, it, so to summarize that, if your friend is very bad at navigating, their internal compass may be a bit, you know, um, variable. Whereas if someone you know is really good at navigating, their internal compass in the terms of 
um, a code in the brain that represents uh, a orientation with respect to the environment is more precise. So that's the that's the brain side of this talk out of the way. I'm now going to move to our large scale study in um, 3.6 3.9 million people. So this is a study um, we ran, and as, as uh, Klaus mentioned at the beginning in 2016, Michael Hornberger and myself set up a, a video game. Here's some images from that video game. Um, and we've published a number of papers since, and we have many, many manuscripts to go to, to produce from this study. So what we, what we were able to do in this study was to employ a professional games company to build a, a game in which you play a little boat navigating through a whole range of diff 75 different environments, seeking out checkpoints that you needed to get to, or finding flare guns and shooting back. And part of the task in this is to find these magical sea monsters that you photograph. Initially, the games design designers wanted these to be captured, slaughtered, and uh, hung up, and it'd be a really bloody, violent game. But the uh, charities involved didn't think that was going to be great for their image um, and putting out. So it turned into a photograph-based game. Um, but the, the main upshot of these sort of photographing is just to motivate people and get the data, people to share things through social media. So it was quite a, quite a process of working with um, a games company and a, a, um, a company involved in social media to make this all work. Uh, but the reason we reached out to 3.9 million people was that we just did, that this was funded by T-Mobile, who have the biggest revenues in the world for uh, mobile games. And they really wanted to do something with their brand to reach out and look good, but also do something genuine. The whole reason we were able to build the game and do that is the idea um, behind this is that we currently lack good diagnostics for early Alzheimer's, the earlier stages of Alzheimer's dementia, uh, and where spatial navigation really seems to be one of the first problems in that particular disease, that people become disoriented. And most of the gold standard tests for Alzheimer's are kind of paper and pencil episodic memory tasks which tend to be impaired slightly later in the disease. But it's very hard to have a neuropsychological test of navigation and you need a large you know, uh, sample to benchmark how well people do. So we hope to get 100,000, but we got 3.9 million people playing due to the success of this uh, game and the advertising behind it. But here's just some examples of the, the data. So um, here's one of the levels you're looking down on a map and there are a bunch of checkpoints the person needs to get to. And we can map out the whole distribution of hundreds of thousands of people where they go in this game. And you can see really good navigators and really bad navigators. But in the next slide, I'll show you what it actually looks like to do one of our navigation tasks in this. There's a short tutorial where you learn how to play the game. But by level eight, you are now familiar with the task where you're shown where you are, where three different checkpoints to get to are, and you navigate by tapping. So this game was on the App Store. It's no longer available currently, but we're hoping to get it back up for researchers to run projects with by the end of summer. So this person's very good. They've, they've, they can just tap left or right on their phone and they can, or on a tablet, and they can swipe forward to go faster. And they're reaching these checkpoints in the right order. They've memorized that map well. Um, and here they're realized they're meant to avoid that, that uh, checkpoint on the right because they've already been there and they're honing in on the last checkpoint and that's the end of their, their journey. So that person was extremely good at navigating. As you can see, it's made by a games company. So it tells you you're amazing and you win three stars and you can do up your boat and put new colors on it and buy flags and it's still gamified. And indeed on our research now, we do add all these features to make people happier because they do, they do work, not just for small children. Um, but the upshot is that as, ev as each of those 3.9 million people go through and do these tasks, we map where are they in the environment, what's their orientation, and that allows us to map that out. Uh, if I show you 3.9 million people in a graph, you won't see anything. You'll just see a big picture of a paintbrush being moved through the environment. But if I downsample 3.9 million to 100 and let you watch them navigate through this map, you start to see what the kind of data looks like. And in my view, it's extremely rich. This is the data set we'll be playing with for some time. So here, that question of what makes a good navigator really comes to the fore. Why are those people at the front doing so well? And why is someone going backwards? Um, you know, you can tell here who you'd want to be your friend navigating. So they're going to checkpoint one, most people. Now you'll see this one red dot. That's actually someone who actually is clinically diagnosed with problems wayfinding. They don't have amnesia. They have a job, but they, they cannot hold down. They cannot navigate in familiar buildings very well. But you see they're not the only one who's uh, having a hard time navigating around. 
But anyway, the upshot of this is that the, the data is extremely rich. And as it goes on, if I jump forward to the end of this, you'll see there's only a few people left in this poor, um, uh, this, this particular patient still unable to find their way to the goal. Um, so what we're seeking to do in our work is explain why are these navigators do some of them doing so well and some of them doing so badly and why do they end up where they go and forecast distributions in these maps. That is a, an exciting aim for the future. But today I'm going to just report what we generally find. So in that population of 100 people, you could see people who are good, people who are bad and people in the middle. Now, we're going to look at two key variables. One is age and one is gender. So I'm going to plot on this graph uh, performance. So zero is fantastic. These are people who are really, really good navigators. I'm going to plot that over the lifetime because we have enough data to go from 20 right through to 100. Um, we don't know about children due to ethics of getting this launched. And uh, there are people listening on this call who, who are much more uh, experts than, than me at thinking about this. But hopefully we will later this year understand more about younger children. But we can add plots. So we'd expect, I was hoping we'd see this as you get older, there's a kind of a plateau. And suddenly, maybe late in life, we get much worse at navigating, was my hope. And there wouldn't be much difference between men and women. What we actually see is that from the earliest age, right through the lifespan up to mid 70s, you just get steadily worse, monotonically worse at navigating. And there's no interaction between age and gender. There's just a consistent male advantage that men appear to be doing better than women at every point in life. What you should be looking at is thinking, what is going on after the age of 75? What happens in this data? Now, this is the, one of the most striking examples we've ever seen of a selection bias. So here is somebody over here who's 95, who've gone in, they decide to play an action, fast-paced video game they've seen. Now, they're equivalent in performance to someone in their 50s. So I think this is not only this is selection bias for very healthy, older players. Uh, we remove outliers on the edges. We do a lot of sifting through this data. So it's not just these aren't just people faking things, but you know, there's a really strong selection bias. So most of the data I'm looking at today is sort of up to the point we can see the selection bias kicking in. So question B, we can see this difference. We can also see this varies around the world where these, you know, this age and gender plotted out. So there is a strong effect of both age and gender in our data. But what about uh, countries? We asked people where people were from. So we're able to provide the first world map of navigators. So if you want to know who's a good navigator, you could ask which country do people come from. It's not anywhere near as useful as knowing what, how old somebody is, but it is, it is a, it's a reasonable uh, variable to consider. So what we saw when we plotted this out was that uh, there seemed to be using a K-means clustering approach. There are five groups of like tribes of navigators on our planet um, in the sense there's a group of sort of North, North American, Northern Europeans and Antipodeans who fall into a group of very good navigators. Um, and then there are clusters within Europe um, and other clusters where people are performing less well, but have a similar navigation skill. Now, an important question is what might be driving these patterns that we see? And a key one is wealth. What we're looking at here is a correlation between each one. Now, what we're doing with that see here request data is taking the mean of a population, a large population in many cases of a whole group of people in our data, 3.9 million sampling down across these countries. Um, I think it's 58 countries are going into this plot. We're on the y-axis is the conditional modes rank out of a, a linear mixed model of the navigation performance. So very low on this is someone who's very good. So you can now see the world's best navigators come from Finland when you account for age and uh, gender and other factors. Uh, unfortunately, the world's worst navigators in this set seem in this particular timestamp from Egypt. But what's driving that appears to be, or one of the major, I can't say driving that, it's a really important caveat. It's not driving, but we can see a relationship between the performance that a country has in our task and the GDP per capita. Now, that, so that suggests that more wealth, the better health care, the better education a country has, uh, the better their, their, their population will be at navigating. So that's one factor that might explain why people might be good at navigating is they just got better education, they're healthier people, etc. Um, what you should also be querying here is thinking, maybe this is just video games. You've given people a video game and people in wealthy countries play more video games than in countries with less economic wealth. And that's what we're seeing. As it turns out, the UK has the best 
video games players on our score. We get that from looking at the first level, how quickly people can pick up the game. Um, so we have a different metric and it's not related to their um, navigation skill as such. These are two very independent variables. So navigation, so video games playing is not strongly related to GDP, whereas our metric of how well people can navigate these environments, their performance in that task is related to GDP. Um, so it does appear to be more cognitively demanding tasks are better linked to, to GDP. Um, but yeah, you can see this variation in there across these countries. And a lot of the top countries have, um, uh, you know, use, yeah, do a lot of driving. It's one of the key things we, we noticed that the USA and Australia and other countries in Canada, people tend to drive a lot. But that's not true in Denmark and uh, Finland and Norway and, you know, Sweden. Why are these countries so good at navigating? Well, we discovered a lot of people wrote to us after we presented this, say, did you know, Hugo, that it turns out that school in these Scandic countries, in the Nordic uh, countries, people are trained to do orienteering at school. So um, we'll come back to that in a moment. That might explain why these countries um, do so well. Um, but another key thing we want to look at is this gender difference. So in that chart I mentioned earlier, we looked at navigation skill men, um, shown in red here, are doing better across the lifespan of women. But that's the average of the world. Some countries, this is negligible, and others is a huge gap. We wondered about whether we could explain that. And indeed, we found that this gap, so this is on the y-axis, this gap between this, so here would be the average here in the middle, like Slovenia would have a representative graph like this. But Finland, there would be almost no difference between men and women. Now, when we look at the economic Davos's uh, economic, the economic World Health um, Forum have a gender gap index where they rank each country on how unequal it is between men and women. So in some countries, there are just no women in parliament. They don't have a role uh, you know, some countries, women aren't allowed to drive and so on. There's a lot of inequality. So the more inequality, the bigger the difference between men and women on our cognitive navigation task. So what this suggests is that um, to us is that there may be biological differences between men and women that, that differ in navigation. But my goodness, there's a very strong cultural one that's driven by these economic, sorry, by these cultural differences um, that can be met that can be measured by this gender gap index. So again, what might make a good navigator is someone who's been raised to be confident and has access to driving and all the things you might see in um, countries like Norway and Finland, where women are also trained to do this task of orienteering, whereas in other countries they're they're not given the same opportunities. So when people look at these gender differences, I think we'd be really careful to think who are the which where is the data coming from, which country is it coming from, because. It's a really important factor. So I mentioned this orienteering. Here's a picture of people actually doing orienteering. So it's very much like our task. People are given a map and a compass and they have to run around to checkpoints in uh, large open fields to find them. Uh, and uh, you win prizes if you're good at this at, at a national level. So in fact, there's a number of 13 countries that compete internationally to win a prize for the best navigators in the world uh, doing this. And what we found is that the, the more gold medals they win, the better their performance in Sierra Quest as a population, as a rank. So this is, this is like one of those correlations. You'll be very cautious. There's a small number of countries. Um, you know, it's like Nobel Prizes and chocolates correlate very nicely. But here we're looking at navigation performance in a video game and gold medals won using um, in this orienteering. But either way, I guess this is just some evidence of validity that our navigation tasks may map onto real world uh, phenomenon. Um, and you can see the top performing uh, country, Sweden at the moment, still, uh, still doing very well. So what about that, that validity about the real world? We've made a video game on a phone. How accurate is it at actually explaining real world performance? Well, that's what we found that it was pretty good. We could we could see a nice correlation between how well a group of people in London navigated in our video game and how well they navigated in a mocked up similar version in Covent Garden. And you can see here is people taking like 500 meters to get to their target in Covent Garden. And there's someone going one and a half kilometers when they didn't need to all around the houses. But there, to some degree, we can predict that kind of uh, pattern. We repeated the whole experiment again in Paris in the Montmartre area and found again a very similar pattern. Uh, also, again, with somebody who went a very long way all around the houses in the real world, but this similar correlation. What I really liked about this, we published this in PLOS One, what I really liked about our data was that you can measure how good they are at video games, but how well they pick up the game. And that tells you nothing 
about how well they will get lost or, or find their way in, in London or Paris. You really need to measure their, their distance, how well they go in, in the uh, navigation tasks. So it's not just a general performance at digital tasks that will predict real world performance. Well, we were set out on our mission with 3.9 million people to, to look at uh, navigation um, as a diagnostic. And indeed, we found evidence, Michael Hornberger's group, that people who have a genetic variant, the APOE gene, or the Epsilon 4 carriers of um, a gene variant, are actually taking longer routes in our in our CERO quest. And because we've got a vast population of data, we can get means, uh, like a, a distribution for each individual, like a 75-year-old right-handed male who's had lots of education, we can give you the expected curve of how well they will perform. Uh, and something we published in this paper in PS suggesting that this could be quite a sensitive measure. It was more sensitive than the gold standard measures for uh, detecting Alzheimer's. Uh, and what you'll notice is something that um, others have found in, in papers before with these, these people who have a gene variant that makes them more susceptible to, to a more at risk of Alzheimer's is they tend to hug the edge of environments. And it's something we're looking at more to understand what might be driving that. Uh, that pattern. But the upshot is it looks like this, this task may be useful um, in, in detecting the earliest um, potential markers for, for um, Alzheimer's, but there's a lot more, more research to be done to, to look at that. Um, I'm going to end this talk by just tapping into the last question of, does it matter where you grew up in terms of the environment? Uh, for myself, I grew up in a mix of growing up in a big city, but occasionally going into a rural environment. Some people just grew up in a really downtown area. Some people grew up driving miles to get to different places and, and, and roaming in, in wilderness, effectively. Does that matter? Does it, does it matter? And we certainly ask people that question in Sea Hero Quest. Did you grow up in a rural or a city or some mix of these environments? Um, and what we did now, I'm going to plot a graph with three things in this graph. So I want to explain it in advance. So wayfinding performance is now measured where high on this scale is good. So somebody scoring two on our, this is in a, in a mixed uh, linear mixed model uh, to estimate the data. So a high score here is a very good navigator. And you'll expect this to drop off into the mid 70s um, with age linearly. And we expect men to be performing um, better than women. So you're going to see these, these patterns in there. But I'm now going to also add in whether you grew up in a, in a rural or a mixed environment versus a city. And what we can see, and we're really struck in our data, was that it's very clear and evident that growing up in cities, specifically cities versus other uh, mix or rural, has a negative impact on navigation skill. So if you need to pick one of your friends to navigate and if you know they're young, you know, they're, um, they grew up in a rural setting, they may be a better navigator than the city uh, person who grew up in a city is what this suggests. And this is an effect size. You can see that, you know, later in life for, for a woman, it's knocking about, you know, they have 10 years off their navigation skill growing up in a city. So it's not a negligible effect. It's, it's something quite striking in the data. But there's a really key thing here, and that is that this varies enormously around the world. There are some countries where this effect is very big and others where it's negligible. It doesn't matter in Ireland and Romania whether you grew up in a city or not. So why? Why does it matter if you grew up in the US or Argentina? Argentina is a really big effect. Why? Well, that we found relates to this variable that a geographer called Jeff Boeing extracted a few years back which is the street network entropy of the different cities in the world. So here are two cities. Here's Prague in the Czech Republic, and here's Chicago in the United States, major cities in the world, according to Jeff Boeing. And what he's done is he's measured all the lines. Oh, my internet's a bit unstable. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, all the lines in the, the, in the grid network, sorry, the network of streets, pretty much fall either north, south, or east, west. But in Prague, they go at different angles. But if we plot this out for all these world cities, you can see uh, here's Chicago in the top left, like Sao Paulo. I've not been to Sao Paulo, but literally there is no organization in Sao Paulo streets. They're just the absolute random. Um, so each country that we're measuring our performance and see here request varies on this scale. Like the USA is extremely gritty as a country, whereas Romania really, really wiggly as the streets. What I'm going to now show you is that scale of different countries on this scale. So they all vary up and down. You know, we've got the USA very low here and Romania up high here against how strong, how big an effect, how negative is it uh, growing up in a city? And what we found was a striking correlation between um, that grittiness of the cities that a country that the, that the person comes from and how negatively growing up in a city impacts them.
So what this what this suggests is that it's not just growing up in cities that has a negative impact on navigation skill in our game. It's growing up in gritty cities that seems to have a negative impact on navigation skill. But the data, just to complete the end of my talk today, doesn't quite stop there because we can go back into our, our game and we can measure the grittiness of our levels. Here's a very entropic, disorganized level in one of our games. They have to go all over round and wiggle round. It's very distributed. Here's another level 42 where it's pretty darn gritty. Now, we wonder whether this might affect performance of these groups. We split between people who are, I'll go back, people who grew up in, in countries with really gritty cities and countries with non like wiggly streets. And we found that people who grew up in countries like the USA and Canada, there's qu they're quite sensitive to that entropy within our game levels. Whereas people who grew up in countries like Germany and the UK and other parts of Europe don't really get so sensitive to the, to the grittiness in our, in our environments. And what you can see in that graph at the most convoluted levels is the strongest negative impact to growing up in cities. So someone grew up in the US in Chicago, they're like, they do very badly on our really wiggly convoluted levels. But in fact, take from someone from Chicago and you want to get them to navigate one of the more gritty levels in our game, they might either almost as if they're doing better at that than someone who grew up in a really convoluted city or in a rural environment. Thus, overall, cities are not good for navigation skill, but it's a bit more complicated. And it suggests that actually it's the more that it, it tunes your brain, perhaps, to the structures of the environment so that you're tuned in, you're more fluid with navigating certain structures, um, as in the grittiness of the of a city, the entropy of the, of the street network. I'm just going to end on the last bit. This is the end of my talk that we're delving now into metacognitive, how good people think they are at uh, navigating. So here's like a map where, you know, the Nordic countries are really good. Finland's the top navigators. If people, if these countries are good people, population, the countries that self-estimating how good they are. If I show you a map on the right, you should see the same colors of the countries that Finland think they're fantastic and say China think they're not very good. That's not what we found. We found that for some reason that in Austria and Germany, they think they're fantastic at navigators when they're not actually as good as they think they are. Whereas there's some other countries where they're really much better than they think they are at navigating. And then there are some countries in here like uh, India, for some reason, are spot on. They just know how good they are. And the same with Australia. So we've been delving into this data and there's a lot more to do. But there are many other aspects of the data. We're delving into the amount of hours people sleep, their travel, all sorts of aspects we've got sitting in there. And we'll report back soon in various publications, we hope. Um, so conclusions of today's talk, possibly brain structure matters for predicting a good navigator. Neural coding, yes, certainly seems to be there. The inequality of the environment you go in will affect the input of gender into whether someone's a good navigator. Age definitely has a negative impact from the data we've seen. Um, we suggest there are, there are some cultural effects, like the amount of GDP in a country will, will impact, um, uh, and perhaps that, that self-rating will tell us more. And we've also got evidence that the environment you grow up in, whether it's a city or rural setting, will adapt your, your navigation skill. So finally, I just end on saying in our work we're, we're delving into now, because I don't just run a, a human lab, we look at animals. Uh, we're now tying together rats and humans in virtual uh, immersive environments and rats running around mazes. And we'd like to know if we can predict through the similar coding mechanisms, both rats and human brains. You know, we have to put lava to put humans off in uh, falling off edges in, in mazes, but rats quite reliably avoid edges in real physical spaces. We also have a preprint we put out last year where we can compare rats, humans in a, in a reinforcement learning framework to really start thinking more deeply about what is it mechanistically that makes someone good at navigating and we're still delving into that to, to yeah, it's beyond the scope of this short talk today so thanks to all the people that put in the fmri work the sc hero quest work and the various funders that made this possible and i'll stop there hopefully i'm reasonably in time thank you